imagine that you see a dirty, like an unflushed toilet that's not yours. Imagine that you, um, you, t- whatever, touch some vomit, like all kinds of stuff. It turns out that that is reliably, now it's small, and I'll emphasize that again when I come back to the results. It's a small relationship, but it's a reliable relationship between how easily disgusted you are and your political orientation on the left-right dimension, such that people who report being more easily disgusted tend to be more politically conservative. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, with the the podcat running around behind me. And I'm here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 122. And this episode is with David Pizarro, who's professor of psychology at Cornell University. And David is extraordinarily well-versed in all the main areas of psychology, which, on a side note, he displays in his wonderful podcast with Paul Bloom, Psych. But his primary research interests are in moral judgment. And in this episode, that's largely what we talk about. We start by going into some of the conceptual underpinnings of moral psychology. Just how do psychologists think of intuitions or morality or judgment in the first place, for example, before then turning to the research on praise and blame, social cognition, disgust, and along with disgust, the very surprising but apparently statistically robust relationship between disgust sensitivity and political affiliation. And in addition to Psych, David is also the co-host of Very Bad Wizards with the philosopher Tamler Summers. And there are links to both shows in the description as well as to David's website and Twitter. So uh, comments, likes, subscribes, these things are all extremely helpful. I have this other channel on Twitch and YouTube, Robinson Eats, which I eat some ice cream or something every day and stream and talk with whoever shows up. And then there's also Robinson's Fashion Empire, where you can get Robinson's podcast merch like this t-shirt that I'm wearing right now. And you can find all this stuff through robinsonairheart.com. So I've said my name enough times. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with David. I just finished listening to your 15-part podcast with Paul Bloom, uh, Psych, which touches on all the dimensions of psychology that one might expect to encounter in an introductory course. And while I, I totally recommend it and will have just done that, I think, in the introduction that people might have just listened to, the reason it's salient to start us off is that there are so many different fields within psychology How was it that you came to specialize? I mean, as far as your research is concerned, because you're clearly capable of talking about all of it in moral judgments and intuitions. Uh, Well, thank you for listening, first of all. (laughs) Um, You know, it's a good question. And I have always loved being a generalist. I think Paul and I both share that. That's why we teach intro psych. But in terms of my interest in moral judgment specifically, it's one of the earliest things that I became interested in as soon as I, I think I realized that I was interested in anything academic. Uh, I think I've always been fascinated with just people's notions of right and wrong and and why some people are convinced that that one thing is is right and some people are convinced of the absolute opposite. And I it I started becoming interested in it from reading philosophy, moral philosophy. And then when I was in college and started taking psychology, I was like, oh, you can a- you can actually try to answer some of these questions. And uh, then I just got hooked on that specifically. So really, I, I went to, I went into psychology already wanting to study moral psychology. But when I was studying, uh, when I was first starting out in grad school, it wasn't a very popular area of study at all. In fact, I was strongly discouraged from from trying to study this stuff. Um, so I I 
started studying emotion as a way of connecting it back to morality and moral psychology because I knew that there was some, at least some work at the time in social psychology on the influence of emotions on all kinds of things we might consider moral, like helping behavior and judgments and all that stuff. Hmm. So, that, no, that that's very interesting. So you were interested in why people actually think some things are right and some things are wrong rather than what actually might be right or wrong. And that sounds like a good motivation for going into psychology rather than philosophy, even if moral philosophy is where you started. Yeah, that's a really good distinction, actually. Uh, I think maybe I was too arrogant and was convinced that I already knew what was right and wrong. <laughs> and so then I wanted to find out why other people disagree with me. Uh, but yeah, just the presence of movement was uh, something that fascinated me. And I don't know if it's from early interactions with people who who I was... Per I think I was kind of a, a very well-behaved kid. And so seeing people who who uh, had no compunction doing and saying like bad things, I think fascinated me. Um, you know, it's kind of what fascinates a lot. Of, a lot of my students just love talking and writing about psychopathy. Maybe, you know, there is this sort of fascination with the freedom that other people might have in being able to do whatever they want. Maybe that was a bit of it. No, that's, that is... Uh, very interesting. I mean, I'm obviously, like you say, everybody's quite fascinated by psychopathy. But a few minutes ago, I mentioned that your research has generally been on moral judgments and intuition. So to start us off, there are a few terminological issues I'd like to straighten out, just because I know that words can take on very precise meanings in specific fields that might differ slightly or or even enormously in some cases from how they're used elsewhere or just colloquially colloquially so first off how just how do you think of the word moral in a psychological context the reason that i ask this is that and and maybe you've encountered this in your reading of philosophy but a philosopher of a, a certain persuasion, I, I'm thinking of a moral anti-realist, might object to the term in the first place, saying that there are no such things as moral facts, more moral properties, et cetera, et cetera. So just what does the word moral mean uh, to you as a psychologist? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question and one that is kind of at the heart of so much of both moral philosophy and psychology. I have tended to try to take the approach that what I'm interested in is primarily what people think of as moral. So whatever they themselves uh, have strong feelings about the rightness or wrongness of. And that's actually a pretty wide definition, right? Because um, some people feel very strongly about norms that I wouldn't consider uh, in the moral domain. And people might even feel as if so. So one way that people uh, have thought about trying to wrangle this concept is by saying, "All right, a thing is a moral thing if people have strong feelings about it, if it pertains to the actions of other people, if they think it's universalizable." Um, th like those start to get into what we might consider a moral belief. So uh, you and I, I might have a very strong view that vanilla ice cream is better than chocolate ice cream. You might vehemently disagree with me, but it doesn't bother me that much that you disagree. Um, but if I do think that that uh, you have the wrong moral view, for instance, if I think that abortion is killing babies and murder and you don't, now I care. So, uh, So I've tried my best to have a, a wide conception of it because I am really fundamentally interested in what people think of as as moral. But that means that I also have to be open to the possibility that the concept moral is something that we, as in we, the Western tradition or, or even philosophy, uh, Western philosophy has constructed that isn't a quote unquote, real kind in the world so that there might be some people who have no uh, domain. They don't have a conception of what we would call the domain of morality. So for them, 
issues in aesthetics and manners and and morals are all part of the same. They're just like some norm or another. And that to me is just a sim- an interesting um, psychological question. To what extent do we share the notion of moral and that it might cohere? And I think you're probably familiar with the work of John Haidt, who has argued strongly that whatever our notion is that we have inherited as psychologists, probably from the Western philosophical tradition, has been too sparse a notion. So he's tried to say, now morality is broader than what we think. And so uh, he's argued that there are you know, at least five domains of morality of which Western liberals only have like usually used to. Um, yeah. So there is a sense in which it's an empirical question, but then there's a sense in which it's not, right? You can't, if you wanted to go and do a study on, um, I don't know, eating behavior or uh, on, on classical conditioning, and you told me that you had done a study on morality, I would just disagree. I would say, well, you're just wrong about what morality is. So of course I have have to bring some a priori notions into it, but then I really want to inform that with what it is that the people seem to believe. And I actually think it's an open question as to whether or not there is a domain, a domain that of morality. Um, a lot of people, Walter Sinnott Armstrong, for instance, the philosopher has argued that doesn't make sense to like the term doesn't mean anything at this point. Um, yeah. So just to toss this back at you to make sure that I'm on the same page, but what it sounds like is you're sort of able to sidestep the deeper metaphysical or maybe the meta ethical, that would be a better word questions by taking examples of human experience as given, and then just taking morality to be the thing that, rightness or wrongness applies to. And then you use the word constructed to great effect. I mean, this approach allows us to investigate different cultures, moral norms without questioning whether one culture is right and another wrong and leading to moralizing in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah, you're totally right on that. And, you know, if I were doing moral philosophy, I wouldn't take that approach. You know, I I even have, you know, my own view of what morality is. But it's nice as a psychologist to not have to um, bring that to bear, Uh, you know, but sidestepping is maybe too strong. I think a lot of psychologists ought to wrestle a bit more with what they mean when they use the term. And, um, you know, some have just said, okay, here are the properties of what we're calling moral, Uh, like the normativity of it, the universalizability of it, the straw, the strength of that attitude, uh, perhaps certain emotions being involved. Some have said, well, the notion of justice or the notion of harm has to be involved some way. And they they have tried to mount an argument that we can uh, all agree in whether or not an attitude that's being expressed is moral or not. But I, I, so I, I try to be careful about it um, and at least thoughtful about it. And when people ask me, you know, having done a podcast with a, a philosopher for whatever, 10 years, people are always asking me, you know, listeners will say, well, what do you believe? Like, are you a realist? And I would say, well, the nice thing is like, I just don't have to have an answer, right? Uh, because I'm just never quite sure. Uh, I would rather study whether or not people are naive moral realists um, because I can never really land on an answer myself. Well, there are, there are two other terms that I wanted to ask about, and they, they might not lead to as much substantive conversation. But the second that I was curious about is intuition, again, particularly as it relates to moral intuition, because this can mean such different things in different places, like in the philosophy of math, for instance. Uh, and I think this is actually a very interesting difference. Some people will treat intuition as if, as if it's something like a sixth sense that and for a well-trained mathematician at least might give a sort of direct connection to extrasensory truths whereas in your work I, I based on what we were just talking about I doubt that a moral intuition must necessarily be correct or that there even has to be a fact there to be intuited at all intuition just means something very different yeah and 
I, I actually think that psychologists have abused that term intuition, despite me saying that's one of the things that I study. One of the things that, um, one of the big ideas in social psychology or, or the study of, of judgment and decision making more broadly has been to try to divide up mental processes into two categories. And a lot of your listeners are probably familiar at least with with some attempts at this because Daniel Kahneman wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, speaks a lot about this. And the idea there is that on the one hand, you have thoughtful, rational, reasoned, conscious processes, system effortful. Two. System two. It's terrible, terrible name. Um, and then that other system, system one, is often called the intuitive system. And I think that's fine if all you care about or what you primarily care about is the times in which you're not using deliberate, careful reasoning and you want to lump everything together, that's fine. But I think actually in lumping these things together and calling them system one or whatever it is, uh, there's so many dual process kind of views historically in, in social psychology and in cognitive psychology that they've gone by many names. But in lumping these together, what you might be capturing, I'll just to toss out a few examples, mathematical intuitions that like that you talked about. Um, you have often uh, people lump in anything that's the product of an emotional response. So so a belief or an attitude or a judgment that that comes as a result of an emotional response, they'll say that was an intuition. You might have culturally taught things uh, or things that you were individually taught from an early age, so much so, like or like a chess expert has intuitions about chess, right? There's no there's no thought that what they're capturing is the reality of it. It's just that they the success or failure of chess has has given them uh, a set of beliefs that worked their way in so deep that it feels automatic to them. You might have. Uh, evolutionarily evolved things that aren't culturally taught or, or learned at all. You're lumping together a whole bunch of, of things, all of which might arise as a result of very different psychological processes. At least it's an open question what the processes are. And I think lumping them together and defining them as anything that's just simply not well, well reasoned or conscious or, or effortful is not a good move if what you're interested in is the psychology of these things. If you're interested maybe in when people make errors and you think that reasoning keeps you from making those errors, then be fine. But um, yeah, I think that's an even messier area uh, of psychology because it includes moral intuitions and all of the other things. Hmm. Yeah, D Danny is quite... So I, I had him on the show. It was it was sort of frustrating because I had, I had read thinking fast and slow for the occasion, but we decided at the last moment to talk about noise, which was also a terrific book, but I had to read it largely subsequent to our conversation because oh, we, we shifted. So I wasn't as prepared as I would have liked to be, but Danny, I think at least in TFAS is uh, quite careful to say that system one and system two as homunculi are totally fictitious and then he doesn't think there are any little men or even neurally separate or distinguishable systems that correspond to system one and two, but that they're rather useful tools for explaining things or sorting different psychological phenomena. And I think you're, you obviously know this, but people will still, it will still lead to a lot of confusion, but at least for our purposes, um, I able to take you saying as the intuitive is the sort of thing that happens in system one, this pre-rational thought. Yeah. Yeah. The answer sort of appears. Um, it's not like you had to work your way toward the answer. Yeah. I mean, as a side note, I think that's one of the lamest criticisms of system one and two is, well, they're not neural processes because obvious so much of what we talk about as psychologists are not neural processes like that doesn't like it 
It's, it's a uh, different level of oh, explanation. Yeah, it's a weird kind of naive reductionism to think that that in order for it to be real, it has to be somehow identifiable as a separate uh, neural process. Um, my issue with it is more that at the same level of analysis, or at kind of the same level of analysis, it's lumping together interesting things that we would we might learn about separately. Like if you're, if all of a sudden you told me that it's wrong to whatever you know break the Sabbath. And I wanted to know why. Um, it matters whether or not this is that answer was produced rapidly in your head because it's because it was taught to you from a very early age, or because it was a result of an emotional mechanism, or because it was somehow. I mean, it's a ridiculous example to think that evolution would give you intuitions about the Sabbath, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like you, there is stuff to unpack that might be psychologically interesting. So when Kahneman talks about the errors that are made in in uh, some of the judgments that he's famous for studying, I think saying that it was a result of system one is only really saying when system two is engaged, those go away. It's not giving us a real good understanding of what it is that gave rise to those in system one. Um, I mean, at least sometimes it's not. I don't think. Yeah. Right. I, I, I haven't read Danny's academic papers, but a lot of the explanations behind a bias, for instance, will just be something like humans are naturally bad at probability judgments, something like that. Yeah, right. As somebody who has worked a great deal like with people who who do like this behavioral decision research um, like to make money, <laughs> um, it is hilarious how hand wavy it can sometimes get. This isn't, you know, Kahneman is least of of all of the sinners when it comes to this specifically. Uh, but a lot of people will just name the bias, and then when when you ask them like what made people make that judgment, they'll just refer to the name of the bias. Well, that was uh, that was accessibility, and you're just like, well, wait, no, I was asking, <laughs> I was asking what what caused the accessibility, yeah. Well, get, getting into the uh, etiology of the biases and heuristics will probably take us pretty far afield. But okay, I think that we're on the same page then with intuition and leaving it. A I know this bit. is a podcast about me, but right now, but I'm curious what you think about mathematical intuitions um, uh, because some people have argued, and I don't know if you got into this with Paul Bloom when you talked to him at all. But his advisors in undergrad very famously argued that morality was like geometry and and made an explicit analogy to the intuitions that you might have, the geometric intuitions that you might have. Um, are you one of the people who thinks that that we have that kind of access, that mathematical intuitions are giving a, a secret access to truth? No, I'm, I'm very far from that. I'm the opposite of that. So the people who tend to believe that are labeled... Well, some of them, I don't want to be a blanket. I don't want to be oversimplifying things, but they're labeled as mathematical Platonists. So they believe that there is this universe that is not causally or spatiotemporally related to ours, but that is home to mathematical objects of various sorts, notably sets. And so Kurt Gödel is the exemplar of the mathematicians who were Platonist, and he said something to the effect of the objects of set theory present themselves to us through our intuition in a similar way to how we perceive like visual objects. And I don't have the the quote there, but I just don't think that we need to hypothesize these mathematical objects to make sense of mathematics, even though I don't personally have a fully worked out account of how this would go. But it's I see why it's analogous to the moral case. There are books, my friend Justin Clark Doan at Columbia has a book, Mathematics and Morality, or Morality and Mathematics, that is all about comparisons between the two and questions of realism in the same. Mm -hmm. But the, the so the last term that I wanted to talk about is judgment. And a judgment can be a decision. It can affect the world as when a, a judge makes a decision. Uh, it can be 
based on instinct or an ostensibly objective evaluation of data. So there's system one and system two and so on. So just how do you define a moral judgment so that it can be measured, I guess, in a, in a laboratory? Yeah. Also really good and important question. I have tried to just constrain myself to the judgments I'm interested in that are kind of face valid. So if I say, um, is this right or wrong? Um, the, morally right or wrong? Sometimes it's just to say, do you think this is morally right or wrong? This is morally acceptable. This is morally forbidden, impermissible. Um, and distinguish that from decisions as things that actually impact the world, like the you know what you're choosing to do in the world. And oftentimes it's just, so one of the things I'm really interested in is, is judgments of responsibility. So I'll just say, like, do you think this person is guilty or culpable of this? So if I ask uh, you, for instance, um, do you think that this, uh, you know, son of Sam was schizophrenic and his dog told him to kill people? And so he does. Do you think that he's re morally responsible for those uh, actions? And then I just get your answer whether it's on a scale or on a just a dichotomous yes no sometimes uh, punishment right do you think that how much punishment do you think somebody deserves for doing this uh, so i i try less to to use the term judgment as a blanket and try more specifically to say all right let's just ask people straight up what they think about responsibility or or blame or character in some cases do you think this is a good person or a bad person and there's an assumption there, the assumption that we're we're all reading that the same way, which I think is is an assumption that is, um, you know, it can be sketchy at times, especially when we're talking about cross cultural stuff. Like, what is it? What what might you mean when you say that somebody is responsible or not? But to the extent that we can get some sort of agreement on on you know, if I trip and I accidentally push you over and you fall down, am I morally responsible for that? 99% of people will understand um, that that's uh, what I mean, and they'll say no. Something that just comes to me as I'm listening to your responses, and this isn't at all a criticism of psychology, but I think about how physics, for example, if for physics to proceed, all physicists had to agree on a definition of what a point is, or what zero is, or any of these things that philosophers have been arguing about for <laughs> thousands of years, then physics would never get off the ground. But and it, there's something similar there with psychology. I mean, you can you can get away with leaving a lot of these basic terms like judgment somewhat murky because you can rely on the fact that everybody knows what a judgment is. Yeah, and you can you know if. Like, let's just say that uh, that I had no category judgment and I was just really concerned with, uh, does this anger you when it happens, right? And I just ask you, does that anger you? Even then, um, you have deep issues about measurement that, that have to be worked out. And I think that's one of the reasons that psychometrics in general has been so important. And I think it probably should be more... But, you know, we rely on things like the agreement between observers. So, so if I want to, um, right. one of the things that I have to tell students is a subjective thing can be objectively measured. So if I want to get attractiveness ratings and I show people a bunch of pictures and I ask them all to rate how attractive somebody is, there's an understanding that obviously attractiveness could mean lots of different things. But it is an interesting finding that you get a whole bunch of agreement about who's attractive and who isn't with a bunch of disagreement in like the middle area. But how you ask that question and how you look at the data to, to even say, I have evidence that I have measured attractiveness is, yeah. I mean, this is one of the things that people have said about psychology is we tried to be a hard science too fast. We started relying on on the language of precision and measurements without having really taken care of some of the deeper questions about what we're measuring um, and how. So people will say like, well, 
Did you know that uh, on a seven point scale, people think that this this judge and this condition, a person is six point three responsible. Well, you know, I mean, that is a precise number that you've given me, and you can give me statistics, but I think it's still something we're constantly wrestling with, which is, what does that mean, right? Does that have to correlate with like how you would treat that person if you if they did it to you? You know, there are all kinds of questions that are still out there. Um, yeah. No, and, and this raises a, a meta question that I would now like to keep in mind as we continue talking and actually get into some of your research, how you measured these things and the granularity with which you took those or the granularity of those measurements. Uh, but before we move to that, I had never heard anybody say that there, this criticism was leveled at psychology that you tried to be, or psychology tried to be a hard science too fast. Was that also taking in mind the replication crisis? I know that the replication crisis applies to other sciences, not just psychology, but is that a factor in this criticism or that's just something distinct? Well, I, I think that the criticism is more poignant now because we've seen um, the what happened with the replication crisis, um, the reproducibility of psychological results. But that criticism was actually leveled in prescient ways by a, a, a few different people. Solomon Ash was a social psychologist who said this um, uh, a while ago. And the idea was that, you know, uh, there is a whole lot of descriptive work that we should probably do first before we start doing this like, I'm testing my hypothesis and I'm testing it use, with the use of rigorous measurement. Um, and that we went straight from barely getting psychology out of the armchair and into the, into the world of you know, empirical observation and then right to doing, you know, quantitative statistics, uh, pretty fancy statistics on the things that we were measuring. It does seem like we could have spent a little bit more time documenting the the natural world when it comes to psychology. You know, we've had thousands, probably, of years, maybe hundreds of systematic empirical observation of the natural world where uh, you had naturalists who were just writing down their observations in notebooks, right? Even if you look at, you know, how we started understanding the motion of the planetary bodies, right? You had Tycho Brahe who was just systematically documenting for so long. And then that data was used to come up with theories. The idea, I think, that is a good one is that maybe we should spend a little bit more time carefully observing before we start doing hardcore measurement and making claims about whether or not we've been able to offer convincing evidence of a theory being right or wrong based on on those experiments, those measurements. Well, that being said, let's move on to some of your <laughs> observations. Uh, and <laughs> Yeah, you could... You you sort of need a divided mind sometimes to do uh, work like this, right? All of the criticisms should be in your mind, but sometimes you kind of have to proceed. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so without any further ado then, I saw that you've collaborated with Molly Crockett of Princeton in work on moral praise and maybe some other authors who whose names are escaping me right now. But I, I just remember Molly because I heard her on Sean Carroll's Mindscape podcast and really enjoyed it. But it looks like one of the central issues in at least some of your work is with her is whether moral praise plays fundamentally different roles from moral blame that, and that they aren't just like flip sides of a coin. Am I right that this is a, a driving force of that research that you were doing? Yeah. Absolutely. So the idea is, and again, maybe this is baggage inherited by particular uh, philosophical views, but um, sometimes people have assumed that you have this concept of moral responsibility. That is, to what extent did somebody uh, does somebody deserve 
to be blamed or praised uh, for a particular action. So you have then you have negative actions and you have positive actions. So if I tri- to go back to the example I used before, if I trip and I hit you and you get hurt, we say, well, you know, it was an accident. Like I understand what an accident is, so you don't deserve blame. If I tripped and uh, money came out of my wallet and into, you know, like a uh, charitable donation fund, people would probably say, well, you don't deserve praise uh, for donating either. That was a complete accident. You know, say there was a bank error that that uh, deposited money. People probably will say, yeah, of course you don't deserve praise for that. Um, but the symmetry seems to not go nearly as far as at least some people uh, might think. Where it's not that you are making a judgment of responsibility first, and then just sort of deciding uh, or thinking to yourself, well, was it a positive or a negative action? If positive, then praise. If negative, then blame. We seem to have different rules for when we praise people. Um, and we don't seem to be nearly as, uh, I guess, careful and precise for praise when uh, compared to blame. Uh, we're a little bit faster and looser with praise. We we don't seem to have the same strict criteria. Um, I'll give one example that came from my dissertation work. Uh, there was actually an example I learned later that was uh, written about by the philosopher Susan Wolf. Um, the idea is, suppose that you have somebody who... Uh, has a very extreme negative reaction. They get super angry, and or they're just they're losing it. Something happened, like uh, you you hit my daughter, um, and so I go and I attack you, and I just like, can I curse in this? Um, okay, <laughs> like I beat the shit out of somebody. Um, versus, uh, I carefully plan it out, and then I like on another day I come and I beat the shit out of you. Um, a lot of people will say, well, under the presence of a strong emotion, I think you may not have been uh, as much under the control of uh, under control of your own actions. So therefore, I think you should probably be blamed less. So so sometimes strong emotions seem to be um, not exculpatory, at least they, they seem to reduce the amount of, of blame judgments or responsibility judgments. You don't seem to get the same thing for praise. So if I tell you the other day I was walking down the street and I saw a homeless person and I was so overwhelmed by uh, sympathy that I emptied out my wallet and I gave that homeless person the money, like uh, I might convince you that that emotional state was as strong as the anger in the other explanation. But people don't go, well, you don't deserve that much praise for it. Like you you were overcome by emotion. We don't seem to have that same that same rule. So there seems to be an asymmetry, at least in that specific case, which was what my dissertation was about. Uh, but that's one example of these asymmetries. It does turn out, by the way, if, if you tell people, um, well, I was overcome by this huge sympathetic emotion to donate money to the homeless or to give money to the homeless person. But I wish I didn't have those emotions. Like I wish I weren't such a sucker. I didn't fall for these. Uh, I, I didn't let my emotions take care of me. Then people do reduce praise. Um, but uh, but yeah. So that's you can get people to uh, to sometimes reduce. It's not that people won't reduce praise. It's just it doesn't seem to follow the same the same rules as blame. I'll give another example of the funkiness of praise. Um. There was a great story that came out of, like it was the UK press. It was a guy who was on vacation in Spain, a British guy who was on vacation in Spain. And they were at like a resort, maybe Mallorca or something like that. And he saw, it was by the pool, he saw two kids who were drowning. I don't remember if it was the pool or the ocean, but there was a lifeguard on duty. But nothing was happening. These kids were clearly uh, like going to die if nobody did anything. So he jumps in the pool and he saves the kids, like drags them out by himself. And 
if you stop the story there, most people will say he's the moral hero. Like that's great. That's you know he's obviously putting himself at some peril in doing this, and he he he, uh, he did it. So he he objectively saved lives. That means something. That's a praiseworthy thing to do. Um, and in the moment, he acted. Well, it turns out that the guy afterwards, when the hotel, uh, the resort that he was staying at was like, tried to thank him by sending like a bottle of champagne to his room or something like that. He got pissed. And in the press, he was saying that he was going to sue the hotel for not having a lifeguard on duty. And what he said specifically was, this ruined my vacation. So I was there with my girlfriend and this happened and I had to, you know, save their lives and it totally, totally put a damper on on my vacation. So I'm suing, I'm suing the hotel. All of a sudden there he's just like an ass. And because he sounds like such an ass, people's intuitions, I think, are that he doesn't deserve praise. So somehow your character is is playing, I think, a more important role in judgments of praise than they do with blame, where we might be more willing to look at just the outcome of the events, um, the intention, like the local intention, right? He intended to save lives. If you intended to kill lives, that's bad. But whether or not you're a dick almost explicitly gets ruled out in a lot of these judgments when it's about blame, right? It's That doesn't play so much of a role. So yeah, so the idea with Molly for for this uh, paper was, look, we don't have a good, we don't have, we have a ton of work on blame and how people make blame judgments that actually has a rich tradition in both philosophy, like going back to Aristotle and in modern legal theory, where you're trying to understand how it is that people make judgments of culpability and blame and punishment. And we don't pay that much attention to praise. Like there is not, I mean, we reviewed exhaustively probably every paper that even mentions praise in the psychological literature. And that you could never do that for blame. It's just, yeah, mm. you would never yeah. stop. Yeah. Trump seems to be like, like an exception to this phenomenon where for issues of blameworthiness, character isn't a factor because for the people who love him, he can't be blamed for any mistakes he makes. But now that I think of it, it is possible that those people will just categorically deny that he that anything that was done was blameworthy at all maybe yeah right and they might have such a strong view of positive view of his character that they um, are more likely to sort of in a motivated way explain away like they might say i mean i think this not to be about trump but just in general if you have very positive views on somebody then you interpret even their negative actions in a completely different light, um, you know, and you you can end up making excuses, much like we do for ourselves when we do bad things. Yeah. It's also interesting that we hold people legally responsible op- often for actions for which they might be totally blameless. And so it's interesting that the the law, which on a very sort of naive level we think should cohere and operate in tandem with our moral sensibilities. It doesn't always do that. So for instance, my, like my grandmother died and a a few years ago and some check was, or some IRS check, something like that never got to my mom who's handling the estate. And because it never got to her, She never paid taxes on it, but now there's like this huge penalty. So there's a, so even though she's not blameworthy, but I'm also thinking of cases where everybody sneezes. We all sneeze, but if you're driving your car and you sneeze and in that split instant, a child jumps in front of the car. And if you hadn't sneezed, you might've been able to break, but you couldn't in this case, you're going to be held guilty of manslaughter or something like that. So it's interesting where these things diverge. Yeah, and the law has these strict liability uh, cases where it did, your intention doesn't matter at all, right? Um, so there are some class of acts where it, it just, who cares whether you knew or not, whether you knew the law doesn't matter, whether you intended to break it doesn't matter, uh, we're strict. 
it is interesting because I've I've heard some people describe at least criminal law um, as I think the term that I don't even remember who said this congealed intuitions, where essentially they were like, well, over the years, like common law has uh, evolved such that. If it were ever to violate our intuitions too strongly, it just wouldn't last as a law. Um, people would be up in arms about it. Uh, so I think, I think as moral psychologists, we often don't pay enough attention to the data that we can get from variability in laws, like agreement in laws. I've seen some people do it where they they try to look across various legal codes to see what's similar to make some sort of argument about the universality of these intuitions. Um, but it seems like a really nice source of data for for understanding a lot of our, our psychological intuitions of this. I don't know if you can hear and there's a, a fire truck outside, but... Oh, a, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, now sure that you say okay. I heard something, but, yeah. Okay, so this asymmetry in how our perception of other people's emotions affects our judgment of their blameworthiness or praiseworthiness. Again, bringing in that that meta question of measurement that we talked about uh, a few minutes ago, how did you, is, if this is one of the things that you tested with Molly and other collaborators, how did you test it? What was the experimental design like? And, and how did you measure the effect, the effect size of, of blameworthiness or praiseworthiness? Yeah. So this is now, we're now going back to 2002 or something like that. So forgive me if I get details wrong, because uh, that was the original study that I okay, was talking about. Okay, so that one wasn't specifically. with Molly. No. In, with Molly, we did a, basically a theory article where we reviewed all that stuff. But I'll, I mean, it's the, the answer isn't that different. Usually in this area of research, we will ask a bunch of questions that we uh, believe are conceptually super related, like... Uh, how much blame does that person deserve? How wrong was the action that they did? Uh, so we'll toss in a bunch of questions like that and we'll see the relationship between those questions. So if uh, they all seem to stick together, that is, if people seem to be treating it as if it is the same question over and over again, we like will lump those together. So in those studies, for instance, we just constructed scenarios where we did almost exactly what I told you. We, we constructed scenarios where we describe somebody who's overcome with emotion or not, um, and who does something either positive or negative. And so both in a, a between subjects design, that is, we'll ask different groups of people, one of those versions, and within subjects where we'll ask one person, all of those, um, and show that the you know, like simply put, the average of the questions that we ask that we're intending to assess their their moral judgments of responsibility uh, were all, on average different in those. The trick there is we're using for positive acts we're using a scale of praise, right? So let's say I I don't remember if it's a, say eleven point scale or like a hundred point scale. That's that's easy. How much praise does somebody deserve? Uh, and we would compare the difference between how much praise we say they deserve in the condition where it's a strong emotion versus it's a reasoned out uh, judgment uh, action. And then we look at the blame conditions and we say, we look at judgments of blame uh, in the strong emotion versus the reasoned out. And what we showed was that there is a big difference in the two blame conditions and the two praise conditions are statistically identical. Um, so simplest way you can imagine, I think, doing that. Um, uh, oftentimes in all of these studies, you'll just get an index. So if I want to if I want to study what you think is wrong, I'll just ask you like, do you think it was wrong? How much punishment do you think that person deserves? Is it a bad thing that they did? Like are they a bad person? You just ask a a, a bunch of questions that seem like they're assessing what you're really interested in as the underlying psychological construct, the, the judgment that, that they're making. And uh, you are inferring that those things are all tapping into that thing. 
And then by combining these often, which we do it because it's just statistically more reliable when you ask it five different versions of that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but okay. Did you say that this was done around 2002? Yeah. I mean, it was my and dissertation and I graduated. I feel, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. I thought yeah, I saw yeah. that your dissertation was 2002. So Paul was one of your supervisors, right? Did you work on this with him? Yeah. Uh, Paul wasn't on that paper. Um, I did that with my... So my real advisor, getting back to how I landed into to what I'm studying, my my official advisor was Peter Salovey, who is a social psychologist, now the president of Yale University. So I got that going for him. Um, <laughs> he uh, was my official advisor because I switched from developmental to social psychology when I was a second year. And Peter studies emotions. And I there was nobody doing anything that I was interested in. So I switched over to his lab. Paul actually came, my arrived my second year. He got hired at Yale my second year. And I started working with him. Um, so I do have uh, one paper on moral responsibility with Paul, but this one, my dissertation was with Peter. Very cool. Okay. And one, meth I, maybe this is a methodological question. Maybe it's just a, a hypothetical question. But as we started talking about this, I think as I introduced the topic, the one of the main questions is whether or not blame and praise are flip sides of the same coin or whether they're fundamentally different sort of psychological phenomena. And what I'm wondering is, and, and again, we were, this goes back to talking about different levels of description. So the psychological or the neural, but would you ever consider, or would it be at all relevant to bolster a hypothesis like this through some sort of auxiliary neuropsychological test? Like I have in mind something like putting people in brain scanners of some sort and testing whether different areas of the brain are involved in praise and blame, because that would be just a another level of support for the claim. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's a, that's a totally reasonable thing to do. And you might have a plausible hypothesis about what you might see. I don't, because I don't do neural stuff, like I don't have even a hypothesis about uh, about what I would expect there to be a difference in. Um, but as I generally feel with, with the neuro stuff, uh, I'm all for somebody else doing it. Um, you know, people have, all, like, obviously they've looked at um, different structures in the brain that are, um, you know, about the reward system. Like, uh, so I suspect you might be able to, um, to find a difference in the structures that are involved in a negative social judgment versus something involved in a positive social judgment. I just don't know what those would be. And I'm sort of agnostic about it. I don't, like, I don't, yeah. Um, when I spoke with Paul, he said something really interesting that stuck with me. And what he said was that... He doesn't think any neural explanations are ever as satisfying as psychological explanations. And I've been thinking about that ever since he said it. And I've been thinking about various instances in which this is totally the case. So if I have, I don't know, a phobia of snakes or something, and I ask why that is, and one person tells me, oh, your amygdala is doing this. And another person tells me, oh, it's because you were exposed to snakes at this point and this ha this was traumatic. I mean, that would be a far more satisfying explanation if I want to understand what's going on in a way that will be useful to me. Yeah, I totally agree with this uh, uh, on Paul uh, with Paul on this. And when we did our episode on the brain, we kind of struggled with how to present this stuff because there is a lot, I think there's a lot of great neuroscience out there. Um, but I and I'm a fan of neuroscience if, if what we're trying to do is understand how the brain works. I think that it's a mistake most of the time to think that the brain is going to give us information the other direction about how like the mind, to, to use the term of art, the difference here between the brain and the mind, um, about how the mind works. So I think a, a, a lot of the interesting um relationship between 
the people who do psychological level analysis and people who do n- neuroscience has been really in the direction of neuroscientists taking a psychological finding and trying to understand how the brain works. Uh, I really find I'm hard pressed to find examples of now every time I say this somebody I get an argument with one of my colleagues who does like social neuroscience or something because they swear up and down but but it's hard to think of something where you would give me the brain data and I would say oh now I understand the psychology better and as I don't know if you talked about this with Paul but one of the things that we talk about uh, I believe in our in our episode on this is Usually it's the case that the only way we know what the brain is doing was because we first did the psycho that like the behavioral experiment or the, the straight up psychological experiment. So the only way that I know that the amygdala lights up when I scare you is because we have a reliable way of scaring you that we believe is genuinely scaring you. And we then put you in an MRI machine, an fMRI, and we do that same thing. And then we find out, oh, the amygdala is involved. We never, we didn't build it from our knowledge of the amygdala to to our understanding of what being scared is, um, right? You need to have done the what scares you experiments before you ever get into the fMRI. Mm-hmm. So I know that you have done uh, work on a whole lot more than blame, but I do have one more blame question. <laughs> so you've written up, you've written about blame on non-human objects. So people blame or scold pets maybe for making mistakes, uh, but we can also get angry at objects. I remember this from my childhood quite well. Do you remember or those? pens so there there were various devices that did it but it would be they'd be like a joke pen but where you press down the cap it would give you a, an electric shock so you you would like get somebody at school would ask you for a pen and you'd hand them one and then watch as they shocked themselves so i had a pen like that and i brought it to my friend sam's house and i don't know what how I hoodwinked him into using it i was maybe check out my new pen but he pressed the button and then shouted because it hurt. And then instead of getting mad at me, he just picked it up and then slammed it against the table and broke it in half. And I was so pissed off about it. But I, I, I remember even thinking at the time, why the fuck did you break my pen? I was the one who did this to you. <laughs> so, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that it's, uh, it is kind of a present question. I mean, there's a lot probably aware uh, of some of this work. There's a, a, an explosion in research on it, like our judge, judgment, social judgments in general and, and artificial intelligences, robots, like those kinds of things. And it's still to me an open question as to what's going on when it comes to blame. Anger I get. So like, you know, I get angry at my computer for not working or I say I get angry, I mean, I'm angry and the computer is the one that broke. If you ask me, do you blame your computer? I might say yes. This gets back to the issue of measurement because I've gotten in some arguments with some people uh, who study this stuff. And the question of whether, like how we can really assess whether what's going on is blame is an interesting one. So. I have a Roomba, right? Uh, the Roomba sometimes gets stuck and it persists, it persistently gets stuck in the same place. Maybe I get mad. You know, it's supposed to be one of the fancier ones that's mapped out in my house, but it's not doing it. I get mad at it. And you say, like, do you blame your Roomba for messing up? And I might say yes. But obviously, if you ask me a question about agency, I know that that Roomba is not really an agent. And same goes for like more complex social robots, like um, where you might bring people into lab and have a robot. Some it's often actually a person controlling the robot anyway, or speaking through the robot. But but you have um, a robot break something of yours. You might say you're mad at the robot, but what perplexes me is if 
hard pressed you will say that the robot didn't make a choice. And usually that will mean that we don't really think that it's responsible and therefore not really blameworthy. At least when we believe that about humans, it tends to make us think that they're not really responsible. So the argument I've gotten in informally with colleagues is whether or not it's right to say that it's blame. And so they will say to me, look, people are getting angry. They honestly wish that the robot had done otherwise. And uh, they say, I blame the robot. Who are we to say that that's not blame? Right. And to which I, I just say sometimes, well, belief in the agency of the thing seems to me to be such an important part of the concept blame that I think they're just using the word in a different way. Like, I think if I set them aside and I'd be like, okay, let's, let's say there's two kinds of blame. One where you're just like angry at something that's not an agent and one where it's like deeply uh, agentic. I think at least that they could distinguish between those two. Um, but maybe not. Maybe some people so naturally fall into treating anything that's even mildly agentic seeming that they really are. Like whatever mechanism that is uh, uh, giving rise to a judgment of blame is identical in those judgments as they are with like another full on human being. Um, so to, to refer to the uh, moral philosophy, like there's a philosopher, um, P.F. Strawson, who talked about the reactive attitude. So he said, sometimes we just we just naturally have these ways of treating people morally. And sure, we can turn them off every once in a while, like if if I truly believe you didn't have any control, but it's hard. So the argument goes, it's actually a difficult thing to actually suspend those attitudes when we're dealing with human beings. Maybe some people can't suspend them when they're dealing with their car and they kick their car and they really mean that they're blaming the car in every way that you and I mean it when we're blaming a criminal. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I Before I get to what I think, I, I just want to say one, thanks for distinguishing between blame and anger, because I think that I was, I think I might've been conflating them when I told you my story about my friend, Sam, though I think to use your word, agentic. I'm not sure if it is a word, but it is. it worked perfectly. I think that that pen seemed agentic in the sense that for him in, in that system one moment, it was that pen that hurt him and it was the pen that was responsible for it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think but, that really happens. Yeah. yeah. But what I think about the issue is you're, you're probably familiar. I don't know how much this term gets bandied about in psychology departments, which is funny because psychology is part of the word, but folk psychology is a an important branch of philosophy of mind, though I'm not sure how much active research is ongoing in this area. But for our listeners who aren't familiar with folk psychology, it's the way that everybody without thinking sort of thinks about how other people's minds work. We ha we think that people have beliefs and desires and this sort of thing. And it seems to be quite primitive in our brains. There are some people, I mean, I think that there's debate about whether people with autism are deficient in certain folk psychological ways, but it seems to be pretty important to us. And I wonder whether we are just naturally predisposed to thinking of things in an agential way because folk psychology is so vital to our cognition. So my dog is not that smart, but when he barks, <laughs> yeah, but when, when he, he howls at fire engines and I want to tell him, like they're they're not doing any they're they're not going to bother you. Uh, this isn't we don't need to sound the alarm. But he obviously doesn't understand what I'm saying. But I can't help but look at him and think of him as an agent who has beliefs and should be assuageable and this sort of thing. So I think that that's what's happening with with robots or other objects. We're just right. 
It's interesting because, you know, for biological entities, uh, I think it's not wrong. You know, I mean, they're made of the same stuff as us. They just have less of it. And so we treating them as goal directed at having intentions and desires seems so natural. Um, but this is all to say, yeah, exactly what you said, like the, the, what we perceive as agency in the world around us is, is we're very promiscuous with those with those perceptions, and so there's great work go, you know going back into the uh, 50s on uh, perception that people spontaneously see agency in all kinds of moving objects, and so that you know all you have to do is meet some very small criteria like. Uh, things that move on their own without an external uh, force uh, acted upon them. We just, they just pop out as, as agents, right? They really seem, seem that way. And so maybe that's all you need. So maybe what's going on is that natural process is blame. And then people like me are just adjusting after, after we feel that way. Um, But yeah, I don't know because programmed is going to start getting complicated when we get the full like language models that are emerging now in this historical time period into robots that can move around because when we ask them why did you do that they're going to give us a the full suite of folk psychological explanations right and the real answer will just be that they're programmed to do so, but maybe that's just what we are. <laughs> like maybe that's exactly what we are. We're fancy robots that are programmed, uh, and we have a full vocabulary of agency that we use for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too speculative here, but you mentioned this work going back to the 1950s on perspective and how we see agency in random places. And I suspect, and I doubt you would even disagree that the reason that things like dryads or naiads or wind spirits or rain gods or sun gods, all these things crop up in mythology everywhere is because of our tendency to see agency in Absolutely. Places. I think that, yeah. I think that some combination, I think here's where the, the evolutionary psychologists and cognitive psychologists combine forces to explain, I think really explain why we're so, uh, why our minds are so active in seeing supernatural agency in the world around us. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we see faces in clouds all the time, right? It's, it's very easy to, we have such a, a dedicated system to see agency that all it takes is like a few things to, to get it super active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just going full circle, answering what I think about the, the pen or our tendency to see or to blame other objects. I think that all of this probably stems from some folk psychological apparatus, but now, unless you have any further thoughts on that matter, can we shift gears to another topic that you've worked a lot on. So I'm just actually very, yeah, bef before we go, I'm actually really excited to see what it will be like to have some of those Boston dynamic robots that are f like super good at moving like humans. And then we just give an instance of chat GPT 4.0 so that they can explain their actions. I think it'll be hard not to start treating them as, as moral creatures. Something that's fascinating. I mean, we don't even need chat GPT for that. I'm, are you, do you remember, I don't know who created this chat bot, but I think it was many decades ago, pretty early in the lifetime of computers, but there was some chat bot that had very few commands, but was meant to resemble a psychologist, psychiatrist or therapist of some sort. And so if it got an input that, it had no idea how to respond to. It might just respond with, and does this remind you of your father or something like that? And somebody's secretary or something got a hold of it 
and was, and I'm, I'm probably butchering these details, but was communicating with this psychiatrist chat bot. And when the experimenter found out and wanted to take it back and told her it wasn't real, she like refused to give it up and wanted to keep talking to it because it understood her so well. And yeah, we're, we're going to be very easily tricked by these robots. <laughs> I mean, I think that the finding is even when you know that it's a program, it's still somehow comforting, right? There are these cool experiments. I know you want to move on, but like- No, no, that's fine. There are these amazing experiments on ostracism. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but the the idea was that human beings have a very, you know, getting left out of a social group is one of the the worst feelings that you can have if it's it's your group. So there were these researchers who wanted to study- um, social ostracism. And so they brought people into the lab and the way that they um, started manipulating this feeling was by telling them that we're going to just going to play a game with three people. You're going to toss the ball back and forth. Now, two of the people were actually secretly working with the researcher. And at first they would start throwing the ball to each other like all three. And then after a while, just the two of them started passing the ball back and forth and completely leaving the other person out. It turns out this feels terrible. Like people hate this feeling so much so that I feel, I don't think I could do anything. I'm surprised that passed ethical, ethical board. Well, I know. (laughs) I mean, remember we could shock people. So, so that's that. Um, Well, they moved it to a computer game and they call it Cyberball. And so you could, Obviously, you could have people play with each other still on the computer, just a little computer game, like a you know, imagine Pong, but with through passing it. Um, and uh, they realized they didn't need other people, right? They could just program it in and tell people there are these two other people who are playing. And after a while, the computer is, is doing the passing. Just right, people still feel just as bad. Well, what's crazy is that they finally tried it by just telling people, you know, it's. It's just a computer. There's nobody actually there. And apparently they feel just as bad. Even when it's the computer that starts excluding them and they know it's the computer, they can't help but feel terrible about it, right? And that is the most stripped down uh, uh, experimental setup. So you're right. You don't need ChatGPT. But what, what I think might happen with ChatGPT is if the robot is insisting like the uh, whatever the the guy at Google was talking to, whether it was like an early form of Bard or whatever, that that led him to believe that it had, or at least to doubt whether or not it might it might have uh, achieved sentience. Once they start jumping up and down and telling me, "No, please stop! You're hurting me. Don't turn me off. Like, like promise me you're not going to turn me off." I I I think that people might not just be tricked. Uh, at the low level, like cyberball, but they might actually start arguing on behalf of those robots. Mm. The this I had not heard of that ostracism experiment before, but it's awesome. And what it reminds me of is the Mueller liar illusion, where right for, even when you know for people who don't know what that is, if you take uh, two lines. And you should probably just look it up, but you have fins at the end of each line, uh, one that is pointing away and one where the fins are pointing inward. But the, even though the lines, which I didn't say, are of the same length, we cannot help but see one as being longer. And the reason that this reminds me of this ostracism study is that the connection that I see is that our just as our whatever perceptual apparatus results in our inability to distinguish these two lines. It is so powerful that it transcends our rationality. And it's the same with this ostracism, our, our social cognition. It's just so primitive that we, even if we know that they're not actual agents, we can't help but feel very hurt by being uh, ostracized. Yeah, no, I think that's a really apt analogy, right? There's no our beliefs don't can't work their way down into into the feeling of uh, well, it's just yeah, yeah, it's super cool study. Mm-hmm. So what I wanted to move on to, though, I'm really glad that you pulled us back for that, is some of your work on disgust, and because I 
conflated at first blame with anger and there are, there's this whole constellation of other words that I could have used and conflated it with so scolding for example but just how do you define disgust um yeah so I will admit that this one's a bit easier because a lot of legwork has been done on these emotions already and and you know to the point where where like the neural stuff that I said doesn't matter um, has been, <laughs> has been done on it. So so disgust is an emotion. Now that word has some connotations, but for now we'll use it. Disgust is an emotion that uh, seems to be sensitive to contamination. So it's an emotional response to stimuli that. Uh, potentially can threaten uh, like parasites and poisons, like it might make you sick. So um, it is associated, right? It, it emerges in, in childhood. It seems to be universal. It's associated with uh, one or maybe two very specific facial expressions, the kinds of things that make people disgusted in one culture, uh, often make people discuss it in other cultures. In fact, while there's a lot of variability, the things that are common, like, um, and sorry if I'm about to discuss people because even the words are disgusting, but like urine, feces, pus, blood, uh, all of those things t uh, tend to make people disgusted across cultures, no matter where you're raised. Um, and so, so yeah, a strong emotional response with an avoidance motivation that seems to have evolved in order to keep us from ingesting things that could kill us. So one way to think of it is before we even had a germ theory of disease, evolution gave us an appropriate set of responses such that when we're faced with things that over and over again would have killed us in our environment when it comes to like pathogens and poisons, it gave us a strong uh, natural response to stay away from this. Putrid meat is another example. Uh, Right now, it's far it's far from a perfect emotion. Right, a lot of things that aren't dangerous make us disgusted. Now, a lot of things that are are dangerous don't make us disgusted. But what are you going to do? Evolution is it's not God, <laughs> right? So yeah, it, it's on the list. When people, for the people who care about making lists of basic emotions, like the the emotions that seem to be um, uh, recognized by everybody. Disgust is one of those. So like fear, anger, sadness, joy, surprise, and disgust tend to be those, uh, the list that everybody uh, bandies about. This might be outside your ken, but this was many years ago that I was reading about this. But I think that there are, there, there have been studies in which people across cultures are one they're they're photographed when they're experiencing certain emotions and then other cultures people in other cultures are shown these pictures and asked to identify the emotion that the photographed person is exhibiting and i'm wondering if disgust is one of these where yeah we in fact, that's how the that's yeah absolutely sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but yeah that's exactly where those lists of basic emotions get their strongest evidence for them yeah so dis disgust is always on that list. So so the disgust face is that strong, that wrinkled nose. In fact, there's some evidence that the wrinkled nose prevents pathogens from entering the nasal cavity, and that's why we wrinkle our nose. Um, I mean, so there's experimental evidence that wrinkling the nose does prevent pathogens. Um, so it makes for an interesting story for how it could have evolved, whether or not that's why it evolved. Going back to those ostracism that ostracism study. I imagine that if you had some fancy apparatus attached to somebody's brain and you have them walk through a hallway where you tell them all of these mannequins in there are not real, but they, they're all very lifelike and they have disgust expressions and they follow the person walking through, their brain is going to light up as if everybody's disgusted with them. And Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's actually not a bad idea for an experiment. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, so that that emotion, um, 
Yeah. Now, when we can get into this, but what I've just described is a really low level emotion. It's almost like a reflex that you get. Like if, if you see vomit, automatically you can't help it. I can show pictures. I can get, and I can get people um, in the audience to just reliably feel disgust, report disgust, make the disgust face, uh, close their eyes, not want to see those things. Um, but there is another sense, at least, uh, that that we use in English and in, in the United States and in other languages and other countries, often use the, the word disgust to mean strong disapproval, like a, as a social emotion. So, so we say, I'm disgusted at the politics of Joe Biden or whatever, uh, or Donald Trump, where there it's not at all clear that you're actually feeling grossed out. Um, rather, you're just trying to express strong disapproval, sometimes anger. So for that reason, I sometimes like to say gross and uh, grossed out because that doesn't have the connotations of the way that we, the social way in which we use the term disgust. Have there been, uh, obviously the studies would be quite dimmer. <laughs> I, I, I started saying different and then went to similar. So dimmer came out, but I meant to say different. Obviously the, the studies would be quite different from the ones that were comparing blame and praise because you were trying to figure whether or not they were flip sides of the same coin. But is there a similar, well, a similar program that is aimed at trying to determine whether the social disgust you described and the grossed out disgust are the same faculty or whether they're different and we just happen to use in English the same word? Yeah, no, that's like you're spot on with your question because the way that I described it, I believe that there's a difference. Like I actually believe that when people use the term disgusted in that social sense, that they're not really being grossed out. Now, how? what's evidence for my view? People make the face. Like people will say, you know, I have relatives for which all I have to say is the word Donald Trump and they'll go like this. Um, they'll say they're disgusted. They'll make the face. They'll engage in avoidance behaviors. They don't want to like, like, they will move away from your picture of Donald Trump or whatever. So what, what evidence can I ha have that in fact, they are two different emotions? Because one view, a very popular view, I, I think I'm kind of a, uh, against a lot of the the field that studies this is that disgust evolved to be this grossed out emotion to protect us from pathogens, but it was co-opted socially so that it genuinely is the case now that immoral agents, for instance, give rise to real disgust. It is the same emotion. Um, I don't believe that that's the case. One of the reasons that oh, I you don't, don't believe that, that that's the case. No, I don't believe that it's genuine disgust when people are. Oh, are, uh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. you were saying you didn't believe that the that it branched off at somewhere along the evolutionary timeline. But you are agreeing. So, with that. no, I'm saying that this co-opted hypothesis that people. Uh, so th to be clear, this view, this exaptation view, or the co-opted view, is that disgust evolved through natural selection for the putrid meat and pus. And then because we're social creatures, uh, evolution was like, oh, we could use this same emotion to stay away from people who we find morally abhorrent. And so that view is that it's genuinely the same disgust emotion. It's just that the this class of things that elicits it grew my view is that, no, we're just using the term in a metaphorical way, um, much like we would say, I lust after that new MacBook Pro. Nobody believes that you really are lusting after the Mac. Well, hopefully nobody believes that you're really lusting after the MacBook Pro, 
it's just a handy way of saying metaphorically, I really, really want it. I have a strong desire for it. I think that's how the word disgust is used. I think that it's such a powerful emotion that if I go like this to somebody when they say they bring up whatever politician I dislike, that it's a really good way of communicating that I dislike that politician. I don't think people are being actually grossed out. Now, one one reason I believe this is if you look at other languages, uh, in Spanish, I'm a native Spanish speaker. My parents are, are Spanish speakers. Um, usually the word that we have for disgust means gross, but it's not really used for the social word in the way that it is in English. So I think that if it were really the case, and then there are other languages where it's even clearer that there's the word for gross, that's that low level, like stay away from putrid meat and pus and feces. And then there is a social disapproval and they don't have overlapping vocabularies for those two in the way that English does. I think that if it were genuinely the same emotion that is same neural mechanisms, the same phenomenology, all that stuff, then people would categorize it the same way. Linguistically, they would code for it in the same way across the world, much like people do for um, anger and sadness. Hmm. It's fascinating that you can take this linguistic evidence into account in psychology, but obviously you're going to reach for whatever tools you have, and that's a very good one. But this is this is parenthetical. I I don't know when this would have been. This must have been a few months ago on an early episode of Psych that I listened to this. But I think you said that there is a a word in Spanish for the first time you wear clothes. Is, is that? Do you remember why that was relevant? <laughs> uh yeah. So why were we talking? Oh, we were talking about linguistic relativism. Uh, whether or not, yeah, whether or not Wharf language. Sapir. Sapir Wharf. Exactly. Yeah, Sapir Wharf. And um, so some people argue that uh, there are cultures that encode for concepts linguistically and other cultures that don't have that uh, linguistic label, that term, don't have the concepts in some deep way. And so I, I was just bringing that up because I think about it all the time. Like there is just one word that saves me all the work of saying i I'm putting on these shoes for the first time today. Um, but that the argument that I don't have the concept for it seems ridiculous. It seems like, obviously I do, because I just communicated the concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same. Yeah. Um, estrenar. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, Spanish is so divided, like it may be that in some countries it's a different word. They don't have that word, but but yeah, estrenar. Where are your parents um, from? Just curious. My father is from Chile and my mother's from Argentina. So, and then I, I was born in Argentina and came here when I was two. So, yeah. I'm, I'm Pizarro definitely gringo. sounds like a conquistador name. He was a conquistador, a very nasty character. I uh, hope, I hope I'm not related to that asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for indulging my interest in language for a minute. Now, what then, or in what ways does social disgust, now that we've distinguished between, actually, I think I read in the the literature, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the one account is called the pathogen avoidance account and the other is extended disgust. Yeah, very good. That's Those are the terms that Yoel Imbar and I came up with to try to d describe the two. Um, Yoel Imbar is a professor at University of Toronto who has been my collaborator on pretty much everything disgust I've ever done. Uh, he was a grad student. Um, here at Cornell. Uh, yeah. So we were trying to distinguish between those two. And we report in a review paper that came out a few years ago, we try to cover the whatever basis we could for, for trying to distinguish between these two. Um, there is, uh, there's other evidence, right? But, but one of the things about disgust, the gross part is how um, associationistic it is. So if you are, um, if there's a gross thing and you touch that gross thing, now you're gross. Like I avoid you. This gets back to the germ theory of disease. 
so super interesting that evolution kind of gave us intuitions to go back to the uh, about contagion and so people who come in close contact with pathogens we do avoid people who who um, you know made the mistake of of touching dipping their hands in gross things we, we want to avoid that doesn't seem to happen for other emotions that require more uh more judgment about what's going on so if if i'm afraid of a lion and you touch a lion i'm not now afraid of you right um the way that people use disgust in the social sense seems to be more like fear and anger than it does like grossness right you can't like i'm like maybe I'll say if you touch Donald Trump, I'm disgusted by you now. But but I don't really mean that I'm avoiding you with the same, with the same kind of passion that I would if you had touched. Mm -hmm. My favorite strange phenomenon, somewhat related to this associativity issue you were discussing, is that nobody finds their own spit particularly disgusting but if you spit your spit out like even if it's onto a perfectly sanitized surface and then think about like licking it back up again and putting it in your mouth you just i mean that's a totally gross idea and that's very yeah. interesting yeah it's it's very interesting i think william james uh, might have described this phenomenon when he talked about the self and he was he wasn't making a point about disgust he was making a point about about you know the sort of physical limits of what is me and what isn't me and how just a few a few moments outside of me can all of a sudden make it disgusting i mean hair is kind of that way too a hair on a person's head is not nearly uh, the disgust object that that a hair is uh it's right but as person. soon as it's severed from your scalp it yeah then you it find no it longer feels like, like part yeah. of you <laughs> exactly <laughs> but it is strange i mean the spit in my mouth or maybe I'm going to take this back in a moment. I would almost I would almost want to say that it feels like more me than my hair does. My hair just kind of feels like attached to me, but the spit feels like it's me. But I I wouldn't want to say that like the urine in my bladder is me. So I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe, just, maybe this isn't going to get a us prude, anywhere. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in in what way? So beyond just the question of the relationship between disgust and social disgust beyond this, in what ways does disgust, disgust impact our moral judgment of others? How does it flavor moral judgment? Yeah. And you know, the debate about what social versus uh, non-social disgust um, kind of came about because of uh, the work on moral disgust. Um, but here's so here's one thing that I think is is just true. So because disgust, that low level grossness, is associationist, and because it's such strong avoidance motivation, it gives such strong avoidance motivation. If I can make say you seem disgusting, then other people might avoid you. So because of that, rhetorically, I think it's a, it turns out to be a powerful emotion used in a social sense, but but um, not a social emotion per se. So I say, um, and this is this is rhetoric that's been used, you know, for a long, long time. If you describe people in ways that makes them seem physically disgusting, it's a bit easier to mistreat them. And so women. Uh, Jews, gay people, gay men specifically, have often been described by like people who want you to not care for those people um, as disgusting in a bodily way. Right? So, so uh, I always forget where I read this, but an er like I read an early sort of description of women by like a monk. Who was trying to persuade other monks that they should be chaste, and he like, just started talking about the the bodily fluids that emerge from a woman, right? Trying to get them to be grossed out, presumably in order to avoid to avoid them. But you look at the language to this day 
of uh, anti-homosexual rhetoric is often in very specific terms trying to describe certain sexual acts that that might be disgusting. Um, and so the strength with which we can elicit disgust in people, I think, can le it lends itself very easily to trying to to I don't want to use the term dehumanize. I think that's used too often, but it's a very easy way to get me to, at the very least, ignore you and not care about you, like um, avoid you if I make you seem disgusting. To which I always say, you know, uh, especially with the gay men thing, where where a lot of rhetoric is around sexual acts that you're supposed to find disgusting. I would say, you know, most sex sexual acts are pretty disgusting unless you're intimately involved in them. So you could pretty much describe the sexual acts of anybody and I might be grossed out. Whether or not that has any say uh, uh, about my moral beliefs, I think it's a completely different question. Probably shouldn't, but yeah. It um, also probably yeah. has to do with how attractive you judge the people to be. Well, there are these really cool studies showing that, um, as you might imagine, we have str strong, I've already mentioned, the strong disgust that we can have for bodily fluids of other people because those tend to be the, if there is a disease to be carried, you're going to get it in that way. So s somebody sneezing or somebody bleeding or, so, you know. Um, but that's a problem if you also need, for the sake of reproduction, if evolution needs people to intimately exchange bodily fluids. And so what you get, what you, people who have done these studies is they show that if you get somebody sexually aroused first, uh, their disgust response in general dampens. So, uh, so sexual arousal kind of kills disgust um, temporarily. But the, uh, the opposite is also true. Getting someone disgusted first makes it harder to get them sexually aroused, which also makes sense. So there is a delicate balance there between the bodies of others that we want to avoid and the bodies of others we want to get closer to. Yeah. Did, did you, wa are you familiar with, I mean, obviously you know the name Jeff Dahmer, but did you watch the- The, the Netflix? Yeah. No, I can't. So, you know, I'll re reveal something here. I am actually really easily disgusted and and qu quite queasy when it comes to those things like i i don't even have a stomach for true crime like my my wife loves true crime stuff and i've tried to watch documentaries about it and i just i'm like how can you how can you watch this yeah i just can't but yeah but i know what you're talking about yeah and i know the things that Dahmer did oh well i, I don't know if you know what i'm referring to explicitly uh, because i have no idea if it's based in fact so if it's not then you wouldn't you wouldn't know this, but there's a scene in which he's talking to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist tells him something to the effect that there is some hypothesis that shiny or glistening objects are attractive to men because this effect has been evolutionarily endowed in them so that when they see uh, a woman who is aroused they recognize the wetness on her vagina as indicative of sexual oh interest yeah, and this, psych that. this psychiatrist says that his like violence and blood sort of fetish might in some way be a product of this attraction to women's wetness yeah and I have no idea if this is real, but it's, it is related to what we were just talking about. That is hilarious. I've never heard that hypothesis. Um, and evolutionary psychology sometimes gets into uh, these kinds of explanations that I'm like, really? Really, buddy? So, but I, you know, I remain agnostic. Like, maybe there's evidence for this. But my first thought is, that's a pretty hidden thing. It's not very easy to spot. Like I spot a coin from the street. <laughs> It'd be amazing if it were that easy to spot. 
Yeah, especially in all those dark huts and caves. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> yeah. People would have had very uh, different, must have had, for that to that hypothesis to work, people would have had to have had very different sexual practices for a very, very long period of time. Oftentimes when I'm, I'm reading uh, some of the evolutionary psychology literature that is about the sexual stuff, I I have to really remind myself like what does this say about the what would what would have been necessary for this to actually evolve through natural selection and it's usually something quite implausible yeah mm -hmm. well there there were other dimensions of disgust that i know you researched and one was well i saw let's see what was it it was the relationship i think between disgust sensitivity maybe maybe that's the right way of putting it and political orientation yeah yeah so that is something you know it's interesting you mentioned earlier in the episode the replication crisis and it's it's definitely made i think any reasonable psychologist who's especially social psychologist wonder about whether their effects are real and the you know some of the experimental effects that we reported like i'm doubtful about some of the stuff um that i've shown in the lab because i don't think it was knowing what i know now i just don't think we did it right but this relationship between disgust sensitivity um which is in a nutshell an individual difference so some people really are grossed out super easily and some people not at all and as with any psychological trait um and with most things there's a nice distribution, bell-shaped distribution. Some people really are super grossed out. So all I have to do for some people is show a picture, for me, for instance, of like a knee wound, like an infected <laughs> knee really? wound. And I've seen people in my audience gag, right? People will, might gag from hearing something. So then that's one end of the continuum. On the other end of the continuum, you have people who doesn't bother them at all like in fact they take some delight from it um and of course most people are somewhere <laughs> Dahmer, right of course most people are somewhere uh in the middle there so you can measure this like there are a number of different uh questionnaire style measures and it, you know it's important to say that if some are better than others but if you ask people a bunch of questions about how they would feel in any number of situations that that could be disgusting so if you ask people Imagine that you were walking through a railroad tunnel and you smell urine. How disgusted would you be? You get people to say like zero to five, how disgusted um, would you be? You ask them a bunch of those questions. You get a fairly reliable estimate. Of course, there are domain differences, which we can get to in a second. But if you take that, uh, that general score, if I ask you 30 things that could be disgusting and your answer is some people are in the fours and fives every time, some people are in the ones and twos. Um, now if I bring you into the lab and I ask you to do gross things, your scores on those measures actually predict fairly reliably whether or not you'll do those. So, so these questionnaires do seem to be picking up on an, uh, a real behavioral difference and a real difference in the way that people respond to gross things. Now, if you give those measures that are just, again, about physical disgust. Like imagine that you see a dirty, like an unflushed toilet that's not yours. Imagine that you, um, you t whatever, touch some vomit, like all kinds of stuff. It turns out that that is reliably, now it's small, and I'll emphasize that again when I come back to the results. It's a small relationship, but it's a reliable relationship between how easily disgusted you are and your political orientation on the left-right dimension, such that people who report being more easily disgusted tend to be more politically conservative. And then converse is true. Uh, people who aren't that easily disgusted are more likely to be liberal. Um, for anybody who cares to know like the estimate of prop, you know, the the effect size, it's like 0.2. Um, so it's not explaining a whole lot of That's the still variance. That's very pretty big. It's that it's a reliable one. Now, importantly, when we first found this, Yoel Imbar and I and Paul Bloom published this paper uh, like in 2013 or something. Um, 
we I wasn't sure, like we're using a small sample, uh, not small, but a, a limited sample of college students, two different colleges. We expanded it. We looked at a nationally representative sample um, of, uh, in the United States. Uh, we tried to measure a bunch of other stuff like personality variables to, to rule out compounds like third, third variables that might explain both of these things. Um, ever since we've started looking at this, we see it emerge no matter where we look. Now we've looked at it in um, like 30 different countries using measures in different languages. People in other labs have looked at it. People have, uh, you know, tried to account for potential third variables that might explain for It seems as if this is a real thing. And uh, I think it makes sense. I think that one of the things that it means to be more conservative is to have a uh, higher suspicion, behavioral suspicion, a dis, uh, 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 alertness against things that might actually be potentially dangerous. That is why, uh, you know, what it means to be conservative is you're going to explore less. You're going to try different dishes less. So you're going to the old ways are reliable, so stick to the old ways. Um, and I, so, so the explanation that we favor is that one of the many things that might go into determining whether or not you're going to be left or right on on the political spectrum is something like your emotional set point for, uh, in particular, risk for pathogens. So when you look at cultures that are. Um, more sexually conservative, and this isn't my work, this is work that people have done, uh, they tend to have emerged in places where there was a higher pathogen load uh, historically. Cultures just tend to get more conservative if they emerged in areas that that had more disease around them. Not whether they have currently more disease, but yeah. Um, I'm, I'm now trying to think what what the immediate cultural conditions were after the black plague oh yeah right i don't know but but uh people did get quite moralistic after that i think um it could it must have been such a crazy time uh to see you know on the other hand people adapt really easily and well so you know people maybe just got used to it so one of the things that i uh, often say is, you know, you might be high or low in disgust sensitivity. That doesn't mean that you can't get used to certain things. So if you, um, if you just have to be a, be a pooper scooper for dogs in a park, after a while, dog poop is going to stop grossing you out. It just, that's just is how human beings work, right? That's how animals work. We habituate, but in general, like your general tendency doesn't seem to change. Um, yeah. So anyway, back to the replication thing. That's the one finding that I am convinced is actually true. Now, whether or not we've ruled out all of the alternative explanations, I'm not sure. But it seems no matter how we measure and where we measure it, people will often ask, like, is the left-right dimension, isn't that cultural? You know, of course, there is some way in which that that is. But there's also a way that generally people agree on what it means to be to the right. So the word conservative is I kind of confusing because it doesn't mean everything. Uh, it doesn't mean the same thing in lots of countries, but whatever that tendency is, like that seems to be a reliable dimension across the political spectrum, no matter where you look as well. Hmm. Well, David, this was so fun and you're such a pro. This was so easy to talk to you. Thanks so much for doing this with me. I really, really enjoyed it. Hey, I really appreciate you having me. This was really fun. Thank you. Hold on, Geeselings. Before you go, please uh, like subscribe, follow if you haven't already, smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.